All right. Um, okay, thanks. I'm going to use this microphone in case I start coughing uh, in the middle. It could happen, be warned. All right, so my name's Jim. Um, I'm an associate professor at KDH here in Shista. I also work at SIX, or RISE SIX, and I'm uh, leading a startup uh, trying to commercialize the work we're talking about today, which has the cool name Logical Clocks. So if, you, if you're a distributed systems person, you'll know what that is. Okay, so to start out with, I'm going to talk about distributed systems, of course, <coughs> um, but let's just start out with from uh, an AI perspective or a, a, a deep learning perspective. Many of you will have seen this graph before. Um, it's become quite well known. Let's try and interpret it. So if we look at the y-axis, we have prediction performance. On the x-axis, we have the amount of, of good quality label training data that we have available. And if we don't have much training, uh, training data available, often traditional AI techniques can outperform deep learning systems. But as we get more label data available, they, uh, deep learning systems often tend to outperform traditional AI. So we can see that even if we add more and more labeled data, our traditional approaches won't necessarily get better, but we expect deep learning nets to get better. And you can kind of follow this um, chronologically. So if we start in the 90s, we didn't have as much training data available, good quality label data. And then, you know, as we move along in time, we can see that ImageNet came out as a, as a large labeled data set class, and that enabled us to, to, to really make some strides forward. And at where we are right now is the rocket ship is taking off. We're getting more and more labeled data, and we're able to build much better uh, prediction models. The next question is, what about compute? So data is interesting, but um, here's a quote I, I, I heard yesterday from Rich Sutton. He's the, the father of reinforcement learning. So he's behind TD Learning and lots of famous reinforcement learning algorithms. And he basically said, well, my own TD learning and, and all those kind of uh, methods that we've developed, they're not the future of AI. So the future of AI are methods that will scale with compute. Okay, and th that's quite a profound thing to say, you know, to renounce a lot of your own algorithms and say, well, we have to modify them. We need to modify them to work with more compute. Uh, Google would be at the forefront of this, but wh what does it mean? It basically means that we don't want to have the same problem we had with traditional AI models where as the amount of training data available increased, we didn't get better prediction performance. In this case, what we want to say is, as the amount of compute increases, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we want to have better training performance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's why I'm not having the headset on. Okay. So uh, that means basically going distributed. So if you have lots of GPUs spread across lots of servers, um, you should be able to reduce your training time if you have that compute available. But if we follow the chronological time frame, we'll see that we're very far from this. So even if we start at, out now in the, the mid-2010s, uh, not really much is happening. It's only this year we actually saw some significant movement in, in industry on this particular area. And I'll show you, and I don't know where we're going to be in a few years, but I, ex I suspect that this will become the standard. So this was a significant movement this year. It was widely written about. It's, a, it's a, a big event in the community. Facebook released a paper showing that they can reduce their training time from two weeks to one hour. Okay, and you know that Google are doing this, and, and Baidu and Microsoft, the, the hyperscale AI companies, are doing this. Um, they have bought lots and lots of GPU hardware with which to train their models. And uh, the people who are working there, the data scientists who get paid a lot of money, can train their models very quickly uh, on these large compute clusters or GPU compute clusters. Now, a lot of companies have reproduced these results. IBM had something, a Me Too, saying we can do this too. And uh, some other companies uh, have done this previously, like Baidu. Google don't even need to show it off yet. So why is this important? Well, um, this is actually based on a Google slide by Jeff Dean. He says, you know, if you want happy uh, AI practitioners, machine learning practitioners, give them distributed deep learning. They will be able to do interactive analytics and they'll be able to get instant gratification from their training and their decisions. So if you're stuck uh, buying and you're thinking you're going to buy a, a GPU server with eight GPUs for one and a half million crowns, uh, you still will be a long way from the state of the art. You'll still be at the, like in this picture here, you know, you'll still be waiting a long time for your model to train. So the thing about uh, training that's interesting is that um, there are some algorithms out there for distributed training, in particular of convolutional neural networks, and they don't all have the same performance. 
So many of you will have programmed in TensorFlow, and you may have heard of distributed TensorFlow and said, well, that sounds good, that should solve my problems. Um, but it's not uh, an algorithm or an architecture, if you will, that will scale as available compute increases because what you end up getting is a, a lot of traffic coming to a number of parameter servers that end up becoming a network bottleneck and preventing your training performance improving as you have more GPUs available. And what's happening right now is there's new algorithms uh, are appearing and some of them sound very familiar. I'm becoming an old guy because I know that I've seen a lot of these algorithms from my days in peer-to-peer -peer computing. Um, but they're, they're basically algorithms that enable us to, to more, more effectively utilize the main bottleneck that we see right now, which is network uh, bandwidth when we want to go across networks. So ring all reduces one algorithm uh, I can discuss. So this is a comparison of the two, I would say the two main algorithms you can, you can get drop-in support for now in TensorFlow. Uh, one is the parameter server model, as you can see on your right-hand side. That's part of distributed TensorFlow. Most people are not using distributed TensorFlow because it's not very well uh, designed. It doesn't have any cluster management support. There is a, f a platform by Yahoo uh, called TensorFlow uh, on Spark, and that works quite well in this model. Um, but the one on the left you can see is the ring all reduce model. So basically the GP there is no central server where uh, on every iteration of your uh, gradient descent algorithm, uh, the gradients are sent up to the parameter servers and then they're broadcast back down again. Uh, on the next iteration, you get the new models back to the, down to the GPUs. But on the ring reduce model, that doesn't happen. Basically, gradients are shared between the GPUs directly and there's no central server needed. So in that particular algorithm, you can see it's bandwidth optimal we're using the upload and, bound, and download uh, bandwidth capacity of all the servers. Um, but in the parameter server model, they're all um, uh, you know, bottlenecking effectively on this parameter server that you can see here. So network bandwidth is a bottleneck for distributed training. And as I'm Irish, I'll give you an analogy. Uh, you can see that you know, on the right, we have a bottleneck. And on the left, it's flowing very freely, uh, the gradients and models. OK. Uh, some figures. People always want to see figures. So it's not that hard to get figures, or not that easy, I should say, to get figures. Uh, this is from the Uber team that we know who have been working on that all reduce support for uh, TensorFlow. There's also a Baidu implementation of, of, of all reduce, uh, ring all reduce, if you're interested. But the figures to note here, the key ones will be to look in the bottom right hand corner. You can see, on the, on, if we look at, there's, there's three columns. If we start on the second column, Inception v3, ResNet 101. Those models are not very dense. There's not a large number of parameters. So in every iteration of gradient descent, the amount of data that needs to be sent over the network isn't that large. We're not bottlenecking particularly on the network. But if you look at VGG16, which is a, a larger, more dense network, and the model is quite a bit larger, what happens is that the parameter server model actually gets worse performance with 64 um, GPUs. And the ring all reduce model gets a 40x scale up. Okay, so that, that's basically telling us don't use uh, the parameter server model if you want to train, uh, do distributed training on TensorFlow right now. Um, these experiments were done on synthetic data, and, but in general, some people have been discussing this and they don't see large discrepancies between synthetic data and actual uh, image data if you're doing classification of. Uh, uh, image classification with com convolutional neural nets. Okay. So what about um, <coughs> multiple GPUs in a single server? So this is something that a lot of people hear. Somebody asked me, uh, Ola Sputh asked me in the corridor there, saying, well, I want to buy a lot of GPUs. What should I buy? And there's two options available right now, one of which is quite well known because NVIDIA are very good at publishing it and advertising it is the one on the left. That's uh, they have a, a server with eight GPUs called the DGX1. It costs about one and a half million crowns. And you can get either a P100 GPU, which is a, you know, a state-of-the-art GPU, and, and the even newer one, the V100, but they're quite hard to get hold of right now. And what you can see is that there's uh, not just the classical PCI bus connecting those GPUs with the CPU, but you also have uh, another bus called the NVLink bus, <coughs> which is quite high capacity. It's 80 gigabytes. Um, between any two GPUs, pretty much. And the thing about that is, is that, you know, if you have very large models and you're going, going to be doing distributed training, there's going to be a lot of data transfer between the GPUs, and 80 gigabytes uh, should help prevent bottlenecks on that. 
The problem here is when you go distributed, you're going to go out onto a network like an InfiniBand network, or if it's even an Ethernet, a 25 gigabit Ethernet, and um, you have more available bandwidth within your host than you have on the network, and you'll, you'll bottleneck on the network. <coughs> so the alternative, uh, instead of spending 1.5 million crowns for eight GPUs, which seems quite excessive, but they're selling like hotcakes, is to buy a commodity GPU cluster and to buy a commodity GPU server. And they're based on cards like the 1080 Ti, which is a, an NVIDIA card. And this architecture is becoming very popular right now. It's called a single root complex with a, a PCIe bus. And PCIe buses have about 16 gigabytes per second capacity on them. Um, you know, that's about the same as an InfiniBand, a, a high-end InfiniBand network. So it's kind of matched to the throughput of an InfiniBand network outside, but you will have a lot of internal traffic between the, uh, the cards. The difference between this and a, and a normal commodity server is that you can see that the two PCI buses are connected together onto a single CPU. There's a kind of a, a host adapter at the top. It's like, think of it as being an extra PCI bus, a third one instead of having two. Um, so that means basically that you, you don't get bottleneck on the link between the two processors, the QPI link up there. So if, if each PCI bus was connected to a different CPU, you would get a, a lot of bottlenecking on the QPI link between the CPUs. So that's why it's becoming popular, and um, you know, uh, you know, th you need to be mindful of the fact that that the, the the memory bus can be a bottleneck depending on what type of models you're training. Um, but if you're going to use an algorithm like AllReduce, which sounds kind of cool, um, if you set, connect up a large number of servers, each with many GPUs. What happens is that as the gradients uh, propagate around the network, if you have one link, one network link or one memory bus link that's going to be slow, it's going to slow down the entire training process. So what you need to do is just make sure that, <coughs> that you, know, you avoid having any slow workers, any slow network link. And typically that means you know, don't run this in a shared compute environment. If you're running it in a shared compute environment where you have unpredictable network traffic or un unpredictable uh, CPU availability on your servers, then that can slow down your training significantly. And that means effectively that, that if you're playing like the big boys, the hyperscale AI companies, you're not doing this in the cloud. Right? They're, they're doing this on-premise with InfiniBand networking, and they're either buying the NVIDIA, D, NVIDIA DGX1s, or uh, many of them are now buying these uh, consumer-grade GPU servers. Okay, so to kind of summarize what I've been talking about, there, and there, there is a deep learning hierarchy of scale. So many of you will have seen the AI hierarchy of needs. Maybe you've not. Um, the AI hierarchy of, hierarchy of needs says, well, you need to do data management first before you can do AI on top of it. And in this case, if you're going to be doing deep learning, you can start off on a single GPU, and that will work fine. You can do it in the cloud. There's no problem. You can also buy a GPU server, and you can do training with many GPUs in a single GPU server. That's fine. The next kind of level up is, is what, what Philip was talking about earlier, to run many parallel experiments on different GPUs, because you want to examine different learning rates. You want to look at different hyperparameters, like dropout rates and things like that. And uh, what's happening now that's quite interesting is Google have released two papers this year, DeepMind released one this week, on how they, in parallel, run many experiments to try and, try and find good hyperparameters automatically. So they're actually, you know, doing directed search in hyperparameter space to see can our machines learn good hyperparameters without humans having to tune them. So parallel experiments is a, a very important property, but if you want to reduce your training time, it's not going to help too much because you're going to run a parallel experiment on one server potentially, or maybe one GPU, or maybe all the GPUs on a single server. But if you want to really do distributed deep learning and get like Facebook down from two weeks to one hour, you need to do distributed uh, deep learning. And that means either doing parameter servers, which as I said already, won't scale particularly well, or doing uh, algorithms like all reduce, ring all reduce that I introduced earlier. So um, let's, let's look, uh, take a step back and say, well, you know, I, I'm kind of convinced by this. I have these expensive data scientists and how on earth am I going to uh, get the most out of them? Well, you need to buy some hardware if you're going to do it on-prem, and that means either buying the expensive NVIDIA box or buying a bunch of commodity, or uh, we can call them also consumer GPU servers. So the typical consumer GPU card that people are using now is the 1080 Ti. 
It has 11 gigabytes of memory. If your model doesn't fit in that, it's no good to you. Uh, the 16 gigabyte memory uh, GPUs that are uh, in the NVIDIA DGX1 machines are the P100 and the V100. And there's a bit of a performance difference between them, you know. So the, the, the thing that's, I guess, most to note is that there's, a, you know, you get 100 GPUs for the same price at the top as what you get for eight GPUs at the bottom. And then the question is, will there be a big performance difference? So we bought one of these consumer GPU servers and uh, Robin, who's here, did some experiments and he saw that, well, for this uh, ring all reduce algorithm, we're getting pretty close to, to linear scaling. We can, this particular uh, example is ResNet 101 and we're training it on ImageNet data. And the number of images we can process per second seems to be quite close to reported results for the DGX1 with the P100 card. Uh, the V100 is a bit better, but um, there's not a huge difference between them right now. So there is at least one hyperscale AI company using this approach and what they're doing and, and what we're planning to do at Six Ice North as well, which is our, our we have a cloud up in, in Lulio and we're providing this as a service. But our plan is to add more of these commodity GPU servers and uh, we have already an InfiniBand network there and connect them up and make them available um, for people who want to do parallel experiments or distributed training um, on, in, in particularly on TensorFlow. So the platform we're making available to people to do this is uh, Hops Hadoop. So you can run your TensorFlow directly on Hops Hadoop. And um, we have a slightly different philosophy to many of the existing people who, have, who manage large data. This is what you'll typically find in, in many organizations who are even doing deep learning today on large data. They'll have their data lake and they'll have their big data sets there. And when they want to do some deep learning, they'll copy data over to a, a, another cluster. Maybe it'll be a DGX1 or, or some commodity GPU server. Do the training there and then copy your, your models back that you've trained. Uh, this is not a particularly effective way of using your, uh, data, your different teams, your data engineering and data science teams. So we're advocating putting all of them on the same cluster. So we have an abstraction for that, the project abstraction, where you can put data scientists and data engineers within the same projects. They're kind of like GitHub projects. And then on the same cluster, you have available uh, a data lake, large scale data in Hadoop or Hops Hadoop. And then you have GPUs now that I'll talk about in a second. So Hops itself, I've talked to many of you will have heard of it before. It's a new distribution of Hadoop. It's uh, the world's fastest Hadoop. We got about 16 times the throughput of that you get a normal Hadoop file system. Um, on Spotify's workload, and we won the IEEE scale challenge this year. I don't know if Salman's here and, and, and Mahmoud who were uh, behind that. We have some really nice new, new features. Uh, for example, small files we can now store in the file system. We're getting orders of magnitude better throughput for writing on small files, and uh, several factor and performance improvement for reading. And uh, for this particular talk, the, I guess the most interesting development this year has been uh, work that Robin Anderson, who's I think he's sitting here, did in his thesis um, on adding support for GPUs as a resource in Hops Hadoop. And in mainline Hadoop, they've been discussing doing this and they've been discussing for uh, uh, maybe a year or two and nothing has happened. They want to redesign the resource model, so we just said, okay, we'll do it. Um, so what happened there at some level you can see is a tragedy of the commons. No one company said we're going to push it very hard. So they've spent a long time uh, dilly-dallying around providing it. So Robin did this in, in the course of his six or seven months. Uh, so this is the only distribution that supports GPUs as a resource. So that's really nice because that means what you can do is you can have a, a, a data lake, a Hadoop platform, and you can basically say, in our case, you can do it from a Jupyter Jupiter, um, uh, work or not workbench, a, a Jupyter notebook. You can basically say, give me four GPUs on any host because I want to do a parallel experiment with four GPUs. Maybe I want to do distributed training, so I want 10 GPUs on one host. Or I would like to have 100 GPUs on 10 hosts with InfiniBand. So we can do all these things with, with Yarn and the support for GPUs as a resource, and the InfiniBand and thing we do with, with what's called node labels in Yarn. So the question is, what type of GPUs should you have in your cluster? Well, you can mix and match. There's no requirement to say you have to have commodity GPU servers, we just think that they're the best bang for the buck right now. But you can have expensive, if you have the money, you can put V100s in there uh, on DGX1s, no problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the platform, 
Hops. We have, it, we have this user interface called Hopsworks. And uh, what we're doing in it is we're working towards make it an entire integrated platform for doing uh, deep learning. So we have development and training of models, testing of them, and we're currently adding model serving as a, as a feature, which should be out by the end of the year. Uh, so the platform has lots of the frameworks you will have heard about today, things like Spark, we have TensorFlow, Flink. You can work with notebooks like Jupyter or Zeppelin. And then you can store your data either in file system or in Hive or um, in, in Elasticsearch if you want. What's interesting from a programmer perspective is that Python is now a first class citizen in Hops and it's not in other Hadoop distributions. That means basically for each project you can say give me this version of TensorFlow, give me this version of NumPy or Pandas and um, you, you know, you're enabling programmers to work in an environment they're familiar with. Python programmers like Jupyter and they like to pick their own versions of Python and their own versions of the different libraries. So what is this platform used for? So right now we have, uh, we're running up in Lulio and we have a lot of people doing ETL workloads. So that's extract, transform, and load data. You get some raw data maybe coming in and you want to clean it up and put it into a structured data format to make it available for querying. Things like Hive or Parquet are popular. Uh, if you have structured data available, you maybe want to generate reports and you can do that um, with our workflow jobs or maybe you're, you can even do it with notebooks and output your your figures in nice Jupyter notebooks or Zeppelin notebooks. If you want, you can even hook up um, more expensive BI tools like uh, uh, Tableau. And then we also have streaming analytics, which a lot of work is being done uh, at Rise 6. So we, we're, we're one of the developers of Flink, and Flink is supporting the platform. And, and streaming analytics is really for real-time data that's coming in that we would like to, uh, to analyze and process. And then maybe, you know, put some output in reporting tools as well. So that's, that's kind of the, the standard for Hopsworks, and this is our new kind of area of, of interest. So, you know, if you have data in, in, in a large-scale SQL and Hadoop database like Hive, and you have uh, real-time data coming in in Kafka, you want to make that easy to people, easier to get that data and put it into a TensorFlow model to train it. So maybe, I, you know, I have a new hypothesis of something I'd like to train. I know some features on the data that we have. I know that, you know, if I'm, if I'm like Uber trying to train on, on estimating the amount of time it will take to get my dinner ordered from a particular restaurant, I might then look at, at attribute features like what's the estimated time of delivery of the food from the restaurant to my house at this moment in time. So we'll go to Kafka for real-time estimates. And then maybe I'll look for, you know, go to Hive for, for more historical data about how fast is this restaurant typically. Or, you know, other attributes like this for this particular type of food, what's the expected preparation time. And you can feed all that in and then either do uh, training or inferencing depending on what you're, you want to do. And obviously you have to manage your experiments in this. So this is where we're currently, uh, one of our major fo areas of focus right now in the platform. Uh, we do have API support for making it easier to write some of these distributed um, TensorFlow applications on Hops. Uh, we also have API support for doing streaming analytics on Hops. Um, so you can see things. We have, I have a course now running right now called um, uh, Large Scale Machine Learning and uh, Deep Learning. And we have students who are doing, uh, for tomorrow, they have to do parameter sweeps and par parallel experiments. So the, the experiments will be run as Spark jobs and then you'll do parameter sweeps over many different hyperparameter combinations for different TensorFlow uh, programs. So, um, and then we have support for TensorBoard in the system itself. Okay, so this is running as a, as a service right now up on uh, 6 North. Uh, the, the URL is www.hops.site. And if you're interested in trying it out, you can register an account. Drop me a mail because we have loads and loads of accounts of people I haven't approved because I don't know who they are. Um, so just drop me a mail if you want to, to me to approve that. Uh, so just to summarize, we have, we have uh, at, at KTH and, and Rise 6 and, and also at our startup, we've been working on this Hadoop platform called Hops Hadoop. It's fully open source. It's the fastest Hadoop distribution out there. It's the only one that supports GPUs as a resource. It's the only one that has first class Python support. And it's the only one now that supports TensorFlow. So uh, a lot of people have worked on this, as you can imagine. Um, quite a few of them are sitting here. And a lot of people have worked on it in the past. And we have a, quite a lot of users of the platform. 
And um, if you are interested in it, you can go follow us on Twitter. If you like it, you can star us on, on GitHub. And uh, you can contact us if you're interested in, in working on this as a research area or contributing in some way, shape, or form. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you.